good day. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, so this conference is about France and beyond, uh, the global world of the French. So I'm going to be discussing uh, France's near abroad, the Netherlands. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be discussing uh, French resource extraction in the Netherlands and how this um, affected Napoleonic war financing. So just as a, a brief introduction, uh, France um, finances wars through three sources of funding. Uh, first was domestic resource mobilization. So think about taxation, think about the sale of national goods. Uh, second is credit, so tapping the capital markets um, or unpaid bills, which of course is a form of uh, lending. And third is resource extraction abroad. So for this presentation, I'm going to be speaking about the last uh, source of funding exclusively, so resource extraction abroad. And this is because I want to test against the hypothesis of whether Napoleon succeeded in his aim to make his wars self-financing. So quite a lot has been written. Um, I've gathered about 130 publications on French uh, war financing. So here are a couple of the most important, um, most important publications. So thinking about the historiography of French uh, war financing, um, I think there are two flaws. To start, uh, there's a reliance on flawed data. For example, a lot of historians uh, try to assess uh, Napoleon's ability to make his war self-financing by looking at budgetary data. Unfortunately, quite a lot have used prospective budgets rather than definitive accounts. Second, there's quite a limited uh, quantitative substantiation of research findings. So historians speak in very uh, general and vague terms about the impact or the success of, of Napoleonic resource extraction. So France extracted this and this, uh, or an enormous amount of money in this and this state. It's so very abstract. So these two flaws are compounded by the fact that inquiry or research has moved along a single line of inquiry. So, for example, Eugene White has relied quite heavily on the work by Marcel Marion. Marion has led quite heavily on De La Rebelle, and De La Rebelle has used the, uh, the flawed budgetary uh, data. So there's a, a line um, of, of research moving back to single source, a single error. So what we would need is a break with past methods and a fresh look at the archives. So fortunately, there is Pierre Brandin. Uh, he's published quite a lot on the Napoleonic economy and Napoleonic public finance and Napoleonic, resource, uh, Napoleonic war financing. So in particular, his first book, uh, Le Prix de la Gloire, is very important. So Branda has relied on the correct data. So rather than trying to uh, base his conclusions on public finance data, such as budgets, he uses the financial accounts of the Grande Armée, uh, which are very good. Second, uh, he's developed a methodology for quantifying resource flows that other historians have been able to qualify in very abstract terms only. Uh, so for example, when trying to assess the financial gain derived from forcing allied states to place their armed forces at the disposal of France, what Pierre Branda has done is he's taken the size of the contingent, multiplied this by the number of days of act active campaign, and multiplied this by the uh, daily upkeep, daily cost of upkeep of, a, of an individual soldier. So this gives a, a very sort of uh, thorough assessment of the actual amount of resources that were gained. Third, uh, Branda has conceptualized Napoleonic resource extraction abroad. So he distinguishes three types of, of resources or three strategies for extracting resources. First is ordinary contributions. So this is any plunder or requisitioning done during the campaign. Second is extraordinary contributions. So these are gains, financial or economic gains derived from treaties, such as peace treaties. And third is the savings on the French war efforts, either by forcing allied states to host a French contingent or by forcing them to place part of their military forces at the disposal of France. 
so the blunder hypothesis is quite good um, to start because it uh, allows us to understand the thrust of resource extraction from the perspective of France. And so it's quite Franco-centric, but of course this was the, the most important player. Second, it allows, uh, it allows for good comparison. So you can compare uh, one region to, to the next uh, through the use of a, a single methodology. So that's quite good. Uh, and he gives a, a quantitative assessment of Napoleon's ability to make war pay for war. So this is a, a table of uh, Brandeis research findings. So the two important lines here are the second line, so resource extraction abroad. So Branda estimates that Napoleon extracted almost 1,800 million francs from abroad, or 42% of Napoleonic uh, war expenditure. Uh, and the deficit, so that's the fourth line, is 500 million francs. So this is unfunded war expenditure, and this is almost 12%. So based on, this, uh, on these research findings, uh, Brondard concludes that Napoleon failed in his aim to make his, his war self-financing. However, Brondard uh, has not included resources that have been um, obtained from the Netherlands. And so my pilot study um, has looked at French resource extraction in the Netherlands and, and Brondard omits these, these, these resources. I think the reason for this is that uh, Napoleon did not wage war on the Netherlands. So the Netherlands were, were a French ally, uh, and so Napoleon did not have the opportunity to impose harsh uh, peace treaties. Of course, Napoleon did inherit the treaties of his predecessors, and he did exploit them, and so for that reason, resources extracted in the Netherlands must be included. So, French resource extraction in the Netherlands was was long-winded and, and quite messy. It lasted for almost 20 years and resources were extracted through a variety of means. Yeah? So the five strategies listed uh, on this on this slide, um, I'm going to be looking at just, just the, the bottom one and the obligation to host a French contingent. So this is something that Branda refers to as, as a war subsidy, uh, which of course it can be seen as. So my pilot study on sort of the Dutch obligation to host a French contingent aimed to sort of explore its introduction and how this obligation uh, evolved uh, over time, to quantify the resources extracted through the strategy. And then as a third point, I, I wanted to apply my findings to Branda's hypothesis to shed a, a new light on Napoleonic war financing. So then moving on to the, the second part of my paper. Uh, so the, the French contingent, the, the Dutch obligation to host a French contingent uh, is rooted in the Treaty of The Hague. So the Treaty of The Hague that brought the, the first, uh, the war of the first coalition, revolutionary war between France and the Dutch Republic to an end, and it saw sort of a regenerated Batavian Republic re-enter the war on the side of France. So this treaty has two articles um, relating to a French contingent. Article 17 states that France would continue to occupy strategic points in the Netherlands for the duration of the war. And secret Article 3 that expands and builds on, on Article 17 states that a French contingent of 25,000 men could be taken into Dutch pay. As a general peace, part of it could remain in the Netherlands if so desired by her. And that her is a bit vague. Does that refer to the uh, Republic of, of, of the Netherlands or France? Uh, but in general, there's a, there's a contradiction uh, visible between Article 17 and secret, secret Article 3, and this is rather vague. So this led to quite a lot of disagreement between France and the Netherlands, um, and there's a couple of points of contention. So first is the right to remain. How long could the French contingent remain in the Netherlands? And that, was a, that was an important point. Second is the deployment of the contingent. So could France rotate troops in and out of the French contingent in the Italian Republic? This is important because it, it could mean that France could uh, rotate troops into the Netherlands, have them supplied, fed, uh, rested, and then move them out again uh, to fight those campaigns. 
The size and composition uh, of, the, of the contingent were also quite important. I mean, depending on which arm or which service or which branch of the, of the armed forces are contained in the contingent, that inflates the cost or not. Uh, and finally, an issue was, was this contingent going to be maintained according to French or according to Dutch standards? So this led to quite uh, long and acrimonious uh, and negotiations over a very long period of time. Um, politics often intervenes, politics or political upheaval in the Netherlands prevented treaties or negotiations from sort of uh, continuing to its next phase, uh, and so did uh, uh, political upheaval in France. There were uh, a couple of positions taken. So the Netherlands, uh, in short, uh, tried to remove or reduce the French contingent from the Batavian Republic. They did not want to allow France to rotate uh, troops into the Republic, uh, the, the Batavian Republic, and they felt that composition, salary, sustenance, accommodation, everything had to be according to Dutch standards, so on line with the Dutch armed forces. So France's uh, position was diametrically opposed to this. So they wanted to have a French contingent in the Dutch Republic uh, for as long as possible and a largest con contingent as possible. They wanted to be able to uh, deploy part of this contingent uh, to outside uh, for campaigning, and they were, what, did not want to set uh, have a set composition, they wanted some flexibility. And finally, they wanted uh, everything to, to occur to, to French standards. So there's quite a lot of discussion and negotiations going on, uh, but there were three uh, important treaties or contracts which uh, sort of hammered out the details uh, of the, the French contingent and the Dutch obligation to pay for this. So the first is the treaty of the 27th of July, 1795. So this stipulated that the contingent would be capped at 25,000 troops. Salary and sustenance would be to French standards, but accommodation and composition to Dutch standards. Uh, and it was prohibited from rotating uh, troops in and out of the, the, the French contingent in the Italian Republic. So that was a theory. Uh, in practice, uh, France did not really uh, uh, stick to this. Um, sort of before the ink was dry, uh, they treaded on uh, every article, uh, troops were rotated in, the contingent was inflated, um, the composition uh, was not according to Dutch standards, but uh, it was top heavy, so there's way too many officers in relation to rank and file, etc, etc, and so it's quite uh, problematic. So the second treaty was the Treaty of the uh, 29th of August 1801. Um, essentially, this was the same as before, but now the, the uh, French contingent was capped at 10,000 troops and it was stipulated explicitly that the French contingent would leave the Dutch Republic uh, at a general European peace. Yeah? So these were two concessions towards the Dutch and in exchange for this, uh, they paid 6 million guilders, which is about uh, 13 and a half million francs. Yeah? So quite a substantial amount of, uh, amount of money. So this uh, treaty actually held up quite well, uh, that is, un until the, the uh, Peace of Amiens, uh, March 1802, which of course is when a general European peace was established and France was obliged to withdraw this uh, French contingent. And so they did not, they just, they just kept it there. It continued to linger uh, in the uh, Batavian Republic. They had all kinds of excuses, some better than others. Uh, they said that they wanted to wait and see whether Britain would abide by the peace. Uh, secondly, they said they wanted to ship the French contingent uh, conveniently from Dutch ports to take possession of Louisiana, which had been retroceded to France uh, per Third Treaty of San Ildefonso. Uh, and then finally, uh, and this is Dalyran, uh, he said that he could not remember uh, France ever agreeing to such a, uh, 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 an, uh, a demand uh, to withdraw the, the French contingent. So the, uh, the French contingent continue, uh, continued to, uh, to linger in the Pagan Republic until June um, 1803, when a, a third treaty was concluded, a third contract. Uh, essentially, that is a, this is the same as before, but with the condition that uh, the French um, contingent was now capped at 80,000 troops. So this was the final treaty uh, uh, until July uh, 1806, uh, when the Netherlands was uh, uh, relieved of the obligation to host a French contingent, when of course uh, Louis Bonaparte uh, ascended the Dutch throne. So, assessing the negotiations, 
I think that one has to conclude that the treaties and the articles uh, uh, pertaining to the French contingent, they were ill-defined and, and contradictory. So what was necessary was really a sort of a, a continuation of negotiations between France and the Netherlands. And of course, this allowed for France to sort of uh, throw her weight around to um, decide matters in her favour. And, and she did uh, uh, through applying diplomatic pressure, military pressure, uh, and a willingness to escalate, I think France got most of what it wanted. Uh, essentially, they maintained a, a French contingent in the Netherlands beyond its legal date uh, and at Dutch expense. So quite a success from, from a French perspective. So in total, the French contingent uh, remained in the Netherlands for slightly over 11 years, uh, so quite a long period of time. Uh, and the accounts uh, of the, the, the body that was charged with the financial management of the French contingent, they have been preserved. And, and I've, I've had a look at these, and they allow us to quantify uh, the cost to the Netherlands uh, resulting from the obligation to host a French contingent. So <clears throat> this is the cost of the French contingent per contract. Uh, so there are two comments here. Uh, so comment one is that uh, for contract one, I have started uh, the date on the 16th of May rather than the 27th of July. And this is because the 27th July uh, treaty was antedated uh, to the Treaty of The Hague, and so the peace treaty. So the second, cost, uh, second comment is that the, the cost for the first contract and the per annum cost are quite high. Uh, so this is skewed because for the first two, two and a half years, we don't have any data and there's no data. Uh, so I've had to rely on uh, an estimate by Schimmel Benning, uh, which is known to be somewhat off, but it's the best that we have. So if I want to apply my research to Brandner's hypothesis, I need to account for the fact that he only looks at the Napoleon era. And so I have to divide up uh, my data to correspond with this uh, rather artificial delineation of the Napoleonic era or French history. So what this shows is that uh, Napoleon or the Napoleonic regime extracted 112 million francs uh, through forcing the Dutch to host a, um, a, um, a French contingent. So this is, these resources have not been included with Plan now, they've been omitted entirely uh, for reasons I just uh, highlighted that Napoleon did not conclude any peace treaties with the Netherlands, he, he exploited peace treaties uh, put in place by his predecessors. So if I then apply my uh, findings to um, uh, Brandeis' hypothesis, uh, this is the following result. So I've highlighted two figures uh, in yellow. Um, so resource extraction abroad. And so adding my figures, adding my numbers uh, to Brandeis' uh, uh, research shows that the percentage of war expenditure funded through resource extraction abroad is slightly higher. So not 42%, but almost 45%. Uh, and related to this is that the, the deficit is lower. So Brandner says that almost 12% of war expenditure remained unfunded. And if I add my, the Dutch resources or the resources extracted from the Netherlands, this drops to 9%. So, in conclusion, so this pilot study on, on the, the Dutch obligation to, to host a French contingent, it does not suffice to, to close a deficit uh, in the point of war financing. It's important to highlight, nonetheless, that I've only looked at one resource extraction instrument. There was others uh, I've not looked at yet. There was quite, quite a lot of requisitioning. There was an indemnity uh, that the French imposed. There's exploitation of naval and military infrastructure, and there's tapping into the, the Amsterdam capital market. So it might well be that resources extracted through these strategies may go further towards closing the deficit of Napoleon legal war financing. A second point is that it might be that for other regions of Europe that followed a similar trajectory from sort of occupation to integration into the Napoleonic uh, fiscal military state, that there is resources that have been omitted too, as is in the case of the Netherlands. So it might well be that we might further still close the deficit. Uh, at least in my mind, I think that 
there's an underestimation in the historiography of, of Napoleon's, Napoleon's uh, ability to make war pay for war. Right? I think he may well have, uh, well have succeeded to a large extent. So finally, uh, some work in progress. So I've just uh, published uh, my pilot study in the Low Countries Journal for Social and Economic History. Uh, that's due, uh, I think, next month. I'm also working on a second uh, article which looks at sort of resources extracted uh, from the Netherlands more broadly, so everything. Uh, I'm also working on a conference uh, uh, to be held originally in Rotterdam in June 2020, so uh, this month, of course, that has been postponed to next year. And I'm also working on funding applications, so if there's anybody who is working on uh, similar topics who would like or would like to, 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 to move into this, uh, this uh, type of research, uh, do get in touch uh, through, uh, through the um, uh, email address listed uh, below. Uh, I'm always happy to collaborate. Thank you very much.